far to the south and west of the United States, at the crossroads of the Pacific, lie the Hawaiian Islands. The group consists of eight fairly large and numerous smaller islands, the entire group having been built up from the sea bottom by geologically recent volcanic activity. From huge craters such as that of Mauna Loa shown here, streams of lava flow out from time to time. Thus, some of the islands are still in process of formation. Many portions have no soil, but are wastes of broken lava. On the other hand, there are thousands of acres of land, which today are planted in sugarcane, as we see here, by the white man's modern agricultural machines, manned by laborers of many different nationalities. In Hawaii, the white man's mass production methods, including vast irrigation projects, have resulted in crops of pineapple and sugarcane more valuable per acre than in any comparable area throughout the world, due largely to climate and scientific production techniques. A wide variety of nationalities is represented in the workers, immigrants from many lands who oversee, who plant and harvest the Hawaiian crops. More than half a dozen types of immigrants sweat in the cane breaks under the subtropical sun cutting seed cane. Others burn off the fields before harvesting. Still others operate modern machines whose huge claws do the work of hundreds of human hands. Japanese, Chinese, and other Orientals have become a part of the new industries on the volcanic slopes of these sunny Pacific Islands. The white man has built railroads to gratify his desire for mass production on vast pineapple plantation and in broad cane break. He has devised long chutes down which streams of water carry cane from upland field to cars that move it to the crushing mills of the vast sugar plants. The native Hawaiian has been little affected by the white man's long trains that carry hundreds of tons of sugar cane to the refineries every day, or by the fact that some of the largest sugar operations in the world are carried on in great modern plants filled with strange wheels and belts and other complex objects of a machine age. Let the huge claws tear the cane stalks out from railroad cars to give to the factory machines to make sugar and the strange thing called money for the white man. Let the white man's cities grow up around convenient bays. Cities like Honolulu, where vast commercial houses have sprung up. Where ships come in from the wide seas to rest and to take on new cargoes from the white man's plantations. Along other quiet palm-fringed shores of the islands, the native Hawaiians live much as their ancestors have lived for centuries, under the smiling sky, close to the broad sea that furnishes them much of their food, much of their pleasure. This morning, Lani Kailua plays idly among the rolling breakers after a vigorous swim in the surf. And now breakfast calls. He pauses for a moment for a drink at the rain barrel, the only source of fresh water for the household. Mother Kailua wraps in broad leaves the last of the store of fish in the lean-to that suffices well for a kitchen. She tells Lani that he must catch more fish with his surf net. Fish is a main article of Hawaiian diet. Lani's uncle is grating the fresh meat of coconuts which abound along the palm fringe shores. Although, like most other plants, coconut trees are not native to the islands, which are too young to have developed many of their own peculiar trees. Lonnie's younger brother, Polly, too, is on his way to breakfast, back with a load of firewood he has gathered in a grove of koa trees. Eagerly, Polly gives up the rain to Sister Moana to join his older brother. Skillfully, Lonnie casts the net upon an incoming surge of water in which may be moi and other vari-colored fish. As the net settles deeper, they beat the water to drive the fish into the trap. Nets for fishing have been used from time immemorial, and the Hawaiian fishermen cling to this method in the lava-bordered Pacific surf. 
Meanwhile, Sister Moana is putting the shredded coconut meat into a cloth. The rich, oily juice is squeezed out to make a kind of salad dressing to enrich the flavor of vegetable dishes. Now Lonnie's and Paulie's contribution to the breakfast, brightly marked manini entangled in their surf net. These will be ready by the time the fish now prepared have been eaten. Reflecting the influence of Christian missionaries, Mother Ka'alua says a silent grace. On this morning, Kamea, Lani's father, is foregoing breakfast. He is the head canoe builder of Hona'an, and he is directing workmen who put finishing touches to a sport canoe ordered by white men from a nearby plantation. They have come to inspect and to try out the craft. Every detail has been hand wrought with traditional care and skill. Riding the donkey to school is fun for Polly and for Moana as Lonnie leads the way out through the palm and koa trees. At the school, children of Oriental, Occidental, and Native ancestry pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A game of football underway on the boys' playground is a further reflection of America's impact on modern Hawaiian life. This oriental lad is picking up points of the game. In play as well as in agriculture, Hawaii thus becomes a melting pot of nationalities. Shy girls of the oriental world mingle in playground games such as basketball with daughters of native Hawaiians and show that all find a meeting ground of interest in the games at school. Back in the village, a year's careful work by Kamea and his helpers is now to be crowned with the launching of the sport canoe. It is taken to the water's edge where it is blessed by a kahuna, a priest of the old Hawaii, in a brief ceremony. Then on into the quiet sea for a trial spin. The men who have had it built We'll use it in a Hawaiian sport that has been adopted by the white men of the islands. Steadied by a stalwart outrigger, under the impetus of flashing blades of broad paddles, stroked with enthusiasm by buyers and builders, it begins its maiden voyage. Completion of the canoe is the occasion for a feast. Here, men of the village are pounding poi from taro root. Nearby, Village women carefully wrap fish in long-stemmed leaves of tropical plants. Fish and poi, almost ever-present dishes at meals of native Hawaiians. For the feast, however, roast young pig will be the important dish. Pigs and other domestic animals, like most Hawaiian fruits, have been brought in from other lands. Lays of plumeria flowers, meanwhile, are being prepared to adorn the feasters. A canoe launching is a rare event in a land where occurrences of even slight importance call for celebration. The roast pig, done to a turn on the hot rocks, reappears from its swaddling of green leaves. It is carried in triumph to the banquet scene. Set among coconut palms, the ground covered with leaves of banana. On all sides now, the banqueters begin eating the yams, the baked bananas, breadfruit, and drinking the sweet coconut milk. Fragrant spices are sprinkled over the roast pig. Whites and Polynesians alike join happily together in the simple, carefree manner of the islanders. In eating, hands and fingers play prominent parts. The native way of eating poi is quickly learned. A spirit of contentment pervades the banquet scene now caressed by the sinking sun and the dying sea breeze under the palms of Hawaii's Kona coast. And at last, aloha. Oh.